Yes. So you see, we are twins, huh? You see it seldom, but we are. <laughs> You're right. So, dear uh, Seyo, dear Mr. Ratas, dear Mr. Peter Korb, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you together in uh, Tallinn. And um, we both have a common speech to you regarding cybersecurity in the European Union and national perspectives and European solutions to a shared threat. And um, I would just start briefly with the landscape of cyber threat. Um, and there we see, of course, uh, lots of malware. It's uh, very high, as you know all very well. Every day about 390,000 new variants are discovered. 390,000 every day. And a drastic uh, exponential increase of variants can be stated for the last 10 years, resulting in an all-time high of about 600 million variants we see currently. With more than 16 million different variants only in mobile devices on Android. And this, of course, is really a big threat for us. And therefore, it's not surprising that today's threats in the cybersphere are global by nature as well as we all depend on shared digital platforms, software, and hardware components. The digitization of our society is encompassing because it is attractive and it makes life easier from smart cars to smart homes, smart cities, and so on. And from a BSI point of view, and I think we are all on the same page here, especially Internet of Things attacks are one of our major future risks as we see an incredible fast developing market reaching a number of 50 billion IoT components in 2020. And I think this is really a major concern for us all and we have to tackle how are we going to deal with this area of IoT. Numerous attacks via so-called IoT botnets where compromised devices are used to attack victims can already be stated for the last years. Um, as you all probably know very well, in uh, Germany we had an attack on the Deutsche Telekom routers. Uh, Deutsche Telekom is one of uh, is the national German provider and they were attacked and therefore um, about one million internet users in Germany on Sunday evening, you know, where we have a very uh, famous uh, uh, crime TV show there. All the people didn't have any TV, didn't have any telephone, didn't have any internet, more than one million because the uh, routers had been attacked and uh, of course this caused major economic damage and threat to the trust of the consumers. We more and more face the consequences that IT security is not an add-on to ICT products. For us, very clear within BSI, this is the precondition for digitization. So you don't have on the one side digitization and on the other side you have the cost factor cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a precondition of digitization. And this is something we really have to work hard on. No one will drive an autonomous car and sit in an autonomous driving car if this is not secured from the beginning on. And honestly, all over the world we see what enormous damage unsafe IT systems can cause and at the same time we see the loss of trust into IT if systems are prone to security flaws from their bases. It goes without saying that such a large EU conference today will not pass without prominently mentioning the recent ransomware campaigns from WannaCry up to uh, Petya 2. Uh, until today, more than 250,000 systems were successfully attacked worldwide. In Germany, we had been very lucky. Only a small number of systems were attacked, mainly information displays at train stations at the German railway stations. From my point of view, the problem is recklessly patch policy, but by both users and vendors. Users often ignore available patches while vendors often sell products that are not patchable or do not provide relevant patches in due course. Petya Not Petya was another example of a multiple country spamming crypto ransomware. In tendency, attacks are becoming more frequent and more threatening. The impacts are worldwide. Speaking about threats to come, let me mention in the respect the upcoming elections in Germany on 24th of September, so Sunday in a week. And of course, we saw all different kind of um, partner nations, which had been some uh, issues about the election campaigns, if I may say so. Um, and the range of IT-related risk is broad, comprising identity theft, data theft, manipulation, disruption, sabotage, and disinformation. The range of potential victims is broad as well, compri comprising political institutions and persons like parliaments, governmental agencies and delegates, political party institutions and persons like 
party headquarters, party offices, and candidates, journalists, and social media. We was in Germany, we was in BSI, we are on a very high alert mode, as I can assure you. We have lots of discussions in the government and also on the operational level. And uh, we was in BSI as the National Cyber Security Authority in Germany. We initiated a multitude of activities focusing on three target groups. First target group, election bodies on federal, state and level, as well as the German parliament. There we are offering uh, counseling and support to all involved, awareness training and so on, uh, penetration tests. Second target group are the party headquarters, including the corresponding party substructures with the same amount of efforts and counseling and support. And then of course number three is regarding the members of parliament, the delegates and the candidates which are um, campaigning there and with them we are working together also, of course, with the social media providers like Facebook, like Google and so on, so that they are getting a, a special kind of treatment, so that they are secured in a much higher way. And I think it's uh, not just a, a target of a government authority, but also the social media providers to support us there. And I think there we are on, on the same page. Next week, Monday in one week, let's put it that way, I hope I can give you a clear signal that everything went fine. <laughs> Guillaume, please. Well, I hope it for you, of course. Um, well, I would like now to, to make a focus on uh, the question of uh, industry. Um, uh, as Arne said, uh, first thing, uh, industry is uh, targeted by the attacks. Um, and even if we talk a lot about WannaCry and not Betia, um, I must admit that today 90% of the operational situations uh, we are involved in in France deal with espionage, uh, intelligence, and um, well, our industry is clearly targeted and they lose a lot of information, uh, including things related to our national uh, security. So it is, uh, of course, a, a very important thing. And we will have more and more attacks, like WannaCry and NotPetya, and we must prepare our industry to, to be more secure of course, against this. The other topic related to industry is that they have a huge role to play into research and development. We have to develop it. I will come back uh, on it later. But the very important thing is that we need to develop um, our digital strategic autonomy. We have to be very clear on this. It doesn't mean that we don't want to work with companies coming from outside Europe. It would be nonsense. But we need to have, inside Europe, a real industry of cybersecurity able to produce the security products we need, able to implement cybersecurity by design into a very large range of products and services. We also need to develop uh, trust services uh, in different domains related to cyber, uh, like audit, like uh, detection of attacks like incident response. And we need to have uh, efficient industry to be able to help us to face the, the next attacks that will for sure uh, happen. And uh, in order to do this, we know the theory today. Uh, we know that uh, we must make it more organized. Uh, we must uh, be sure that our industrial players play with the same rules than uh, others. Uh, we must develop cooperation. So we know this theory. And now it's time to go to practice. And it has already started. That's why I'm very optimistic. Uh, we have a case of um, the cyber public private partnership that has been launched uh, a bit more than one year ago. It is really very interesting. And uh, we are really involved into this. We have to find new ways to work together. Uh, we cannot copy the other public-private partnership. And uh, I think we have found uh, with uh, the EXO organization the good way to have at the same place uh, people repre that represent the industry, the big ones, the small ones, people that represent the, the users, people that represent um, national agencies like ours, uh, 
uh, I think it's the, the first time it, it, uh, it appears like this. And it is necessary to, to find new ways to work together because cyber is not a domain li like the other ones. And uh, many people of uh, EXO are in the room since we had a board yesterday, a very interesting one. Uh, Luigi is here, who is the general secretary of, uh, of the organization. Um, we, we learn to work together. Um, we, we have to, to push more proposal to, to be sure that our European industry uh, will be at the right level to be able to face uh, the, the challenges we have. And something which is very close to this is the, the need of a strong certification scheme because we need uh, an industry, we need to build trust, and we consider that uh, certification is an important part of this trust building, but I will let Hannah uh, develop on this. Yes, Guillaume, thank you very much. Regarding um, when you are speaking about certification, and um, then I think uh, it is always about trust of consumers and confidence in digitization. That's the core, right? And that's the key for our certification. And uh, I think the idea of an ICT security certification framework, which NC and the BSI, or both agencies, have supported from the beginning, is a major step. And there we are seeing a growing demand for certification of IT security products and services, particularly with respect to the IoT and the further digitization of our society. Only certification and being interconnected to its standardization allows European industry a competitive advantage and to become trustworthy and successful players in the worldwide cybersecurity and IT market. A European certification framework can only be trusted and supportive to European digital sovereign sovereignty but actually builds on member states' efforts. And I think really member states with regard to certifications such as SOGI and uh, RMIA are playing there a very, very, very important role. And since we're in Estonia today, it is worth to mention that you have become a new member. So welcome also Estonia to this uh, a few days ago. From uh, BSI point of view, all activities related to the EU digital single market policies need to build up on existing member state frameworks instead of inventing new frameworks and labels. I think we have to use also what we are having and to get it more successful than just always inventing new issues. And I think this is a very important message. We should strive for effective measures and we should keep in mind that the purpose of all new ideas we have in Europe should seek to raise the level of IT security in Europe. This is an important thing, a label showing how secure a product is, is a great idea from the perspective of the customer, but it should also mean something. So when you are buying a washing machine, you know exactly how much energy and so on it consumes, but you have no clue how secure it is on cyber. And this is something we have to develop, I think, together. In Germany, we are thinking about a kind of labeling there on a very low level. Apart from this, our responsibility is to foster the digital single market by providing comparable security labels based on common criteria, mutual recognition, and a harmonized methodology. This also includes the capacity to evaluate cryptography solutions. We, as a cybersecurity authority, are doing our job in the context of SOGI's MRR certification, and we agree on Crypto2. We are looking forward to continue our fruitful discussions we had on this topic and hope we can achieve a good solution for member states in the EU. Germany, very clear, supports the efforts of the Commission to improve cybersecurity in our digital infrastructures with the European certification framework and related technical standards as security certification in combination with appropriate technical standards. And this is an important instrument to avoid risk associated with upcoming new technologies before they enter the market and this is an important step to provide security by design. And this is exactly, since we are now going to a new stage of digitization, we need it now to implement it in a way I've just described. And it is the responsibility of the governments in the member states, in the member state, but also at the European level to defend European values in cybersecurity, the protection of business and personal data with the means of transparent and open technical standards and appropriate third party certification. This not only matter, a matter of the digital single market, but also a concern of public and national security. And let me put that down something as a personal feeling what I have. 
sometimes I wonder if it wouldn't be good that we are not just talking about cooperation, but really doing it in a very a, a part, a partnership way. And the way how it was commented and presented yesterday from the European Commission, I think is not been in a very cooperative way, and I really would like to go into the details and really discuss the way so far, but not just giving a presentation there and they say, eat it or die, but I think this is not a very cooperative way how we are moving forward on this one. And this is not really building up trust, and this is my personal feeling, how I feel about it, and I think this is something we have to discuss afterwards in the different kind of bodies we are having there. It is important to note that about 20 years ago, the Commissioner had already set up the first European certification initiative with the Foundation of the Soldiers, MRI, that since then has been operated successfully by the Member States on the principle of mutual recognition. According to the requirements of the market at the time, Soldiers MRI has been operating at high assurance scheme based on the international common criteria standard. Today, this European scheme plays a leading role in the common criteria community and in the world market of secure semiconductors and other related products in the payment industry, automotive, healthcare, energy networks, and secure identification and public documents. Associated with the certification authorities, uh, Soji's MRA operates a significant number of private small business evaluation labs that have gathered significant experience in product security and that have reached international reputation also in markets outside Europe. And it is not coincident that related European industries are world market leaders in these areas. The Soji's MRR members are well aware that future market requirements will go beyond high assurance components, especially with regard to commercial off-the-shelf products, industry automation, IoT components, and so on. Therefore, for us, it's really essential to rapidly develop additional and appropriate certification schemes. And there, for example, Germany and France, I think, also have moved close, very strong and very close in a partnership way forward. And this can be also probably a role model, like we have been doing in different other areas, to move forward. We also recommend to consider the principle of mutual recognition that has already been proved to be successful in other industries in comparison to centralized approaches. One important principle is in designing secure products and increasing the robustness of digital infrastructures is that you allow different IT security solutions to a defined threat and not one fits for all solution. That might lead to a single point of failure and I think this is a way forward we have to move forward. Theo? So regarding the, the operational cooperation, I would like to share with you uh, a few ideas. Um, it is quite obvious that we need to develop this cooperation. Uh, we are in Europe, all the member states must help each other. There's no debate on this. But before thinking about operational cooperation, it should be clear that uh, before this cooperation, uh, cyber defense is firstly prevention, protection, we must do our best collectively to avoid the attacks. If we don't do it and only deal with the attacks themselves, when they appear, it's too late and we will not win this war. So not, do not only focus on reaction and operational things, it's just the last step. Um, uh, it, the, the goal is just to deal with uh, the small part, I hope, small part, of attacks that will succeed. Uh, the, the second thing is that uh, everybody needs to be involved into its own security and to prepare to react and to deal with the attacks. Uh, let me explain. Uh, this message I give it to the industry, to partners, to other uh, countries. Um, the people, the first people who can help them are themselves. It's very clear. There's no, it's impossible in my opinion to develop a kind of cyber umbrella. Uh, um, it is impossible to be protected from other people only. And to be able, when there's a real crisis, I see the in now many operational cases, um, the, the victims that did not prepare to react by themselves uh, are very disappointed by the help they can obtain from outside. And the other thing is that when we want to help a victim, we need to have people with whom we can talk. We need to have 
some kind of experts also in front of us. So my first message is that every member state <laughs> must develop its own capacities. So of course it's difficult. Um, of course it costs money. But we must compare this effort with the cost of the attacks. Now, I, I use just an example um, for, for me in France. Uh, during NotPetya, we had a few victims. Um, we worked a lot with one of those victims who, who asked for our help. Um, they lost 80 million euros just because they are a huge company and during two weeks they were not able to work. 80 million euros. It is exactly the budget of our agency. So it just proves one thing. Well, the first thing is that I need more money, but that's internal in France. Um, <laughs> the second thing is that uh, all the money we will invest into the protection and the preparation before uh, will be well invested. Otherwise, it will be impossible to cover all the money we lose after, and this situation will, of course, get worse in the future. And then, when we have said this, when everybody will have developed its own capacities, and I'm sure that Europe must help all the countries to do it. Uh, it's probably the good way to invest money, also money of Europe, to help countries to develop their capabilities and capacities. And ENISA, uh, has probably a huge role to, to play uh, into this uh, capacity building. And countries like us uh, will, will help as much as possible. We can be sure about this. Uh, so when this is done, after we can think about the cooperation. And the first thing, I think the, during, uh, after the attack, during operation, the very important thing is exchange of information. I must admit that we have huge progress to do in this domain. Uh, just because it is difficult. Uh, it means that we need to have built before some trusted links between the people who need to cooperate. We need to have secure means to exchange sensitive information, that's obvious. Um, we need to talk with the same, the same language. And we need to be able collectively to keep secrets. Because, well, if we just share public information is not so useful, it's, it's, it's obvious. We need to be able to share sensitive information. And that's the reason why, because this information is the only advantage we can have on the attacker. And we don't want to lose this information. In many situations, if we are not convenient with uh, agent of information, it is because we do not want to lose this information. It's not because we don't want to share it with uh, trusted partners. So this is very important. Being able to, to develop this, we have started to do it. Uh, we need to do it, uh, implementing the NIST directive. The network of CSERTs is a very important thing that the NIST directive uh, has built. And uh, we really want, together, to make a lot of energy into making this network working um, to, to, to be able to protect the whole Europe against attacks. And I observe that during WannaCry and NotPetya, the, the exchange between scissors has been interesting, really. It has started. And if I compare the, the means uh, used to do it, sometimes just a few people using very old-style means of communication, but very involved, uh, it has shown that uh, it was very interesting, very able to share this information inside Europe, but also outside Europe. And with other countries, uh, using the fact that the sun is not at the same place at the, uh, at the same time, well, moving around the, the Earth, uh, we got some uh, real advantage to deal with this crisis. So we want this cooperation, we'll put energy in it. We can even imagine some kinds of mechanisms of coordination between us, but always based on the voluntary uh, implication of the member states, uh, of course, involving our agencies. We, it, it would be nonsense to imagine uh, such uh, an organization working uh, without us. Um, we, well, I'm sure that we can make a huge progress 
into the operational cooperation doing this. So I'm looking for my conclusion and that's okay. So what we think is that uh, we, we already made many things. We have networks that are starting to, to work and we will have to invest energy in it. Uh, we are convinced that Europe is a good place to do cyber security, to face common threats, to develop our industry, to develop our autonomy into this domain. And we appreciate really the, the cyber uh, security package. And even if we don't agree with all the, all the details, we consider that it goes really into the good direction. And I often say in France, but it applies to Europe, uh, all the different actors from the private sector, from the public sector, the people who will provide uh, some, some solutions, the, the potential victims, uh, all those people need to work together. It's not just like an uh, idealist idea, it's just a necessity, because otherwise our enemies will always attack uh, where we are not strong enough together. And I would like to, to thank uh, Estonia for this conference, uh, for our cooperation, and uh, to, to thank Arne for our very good bilateral cooperation we have had for many years now, and that is still reinforcing, still developing, and uh, it gives to me many ideas uh, to do things with much more other countries uh, inside Europe. Thanks a lot. All right, well, you managed to cover a lot of ground in a talk, uh, but exactly, I, I believe that the strong message and support really for the cooperation is, is much appreciated. Now, as before, there will be now a chance to ask questions. I'm sure you don't want to let this opportunity go to waste. And to give you just a moment to think about a question, then just very technical note. So if you're speaking in the next panel, you just still don't have your mic, please see the guys at the back, the back uh, tech table very briefly now. So, but questions. Really? Yes. One question there. Can we get a mic to the front? Yes, thank you. Wait a bit. Just a second. Uh, Wait one second. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, I would like to get back to two points that you raised during your presentation. The first one is the um, certification process. Uh, we just went through. Uh, our ANSI certification process. First, we learned a lot. Two, um, uh, now that we got our certification, I would like to know if there is an agreement in Europe that as soon as we got the approval, the certification from ANSI, that we can use in other country. Why? It's not only to, to, to go fast. It's, as you, you know, a certification will take time. And as, as you know, time is a lot of money. And as we did our job, and we did it with full help from ANSI, and again, thank you, uh, I would like to know what we can do with this certification in Europe. This is point number one. Point number two, you raised another question, uh, another point, which is alliance, partnership, or whatever, joint, enfin, work together between private and public sector, which is very, very important for the the uh, European cybersecurity private activities like companies like us, we are not a uh, multinational. It's not for that we don't have a very good know-how. And with the help of a public-private uh, uh, cooperation, I am sure that we can do a lot better altogether. Those are the two points. Thank you. Maybe, you know, well, the certification is a, uh, a huge uh, question, but um, our feeling is that um, we have experience for years, uh, national certification, uh, for including for high level, very high levels, but also lower levels. Uh, we, we built this Sergei uh, recognition agreement, which is already uh, something existing between uh, 14 countries, I think. Uh, it's an important part of Europe. And very basically thinking, 
we we considered uh, with the Commission uh, a few a few months ago, a few years ago, maybe that it was really time to have a European certification with a goal that uh, any certificate issued into one member state would uh, be recognized by all over Europe. It seems obvious, it seems the, it, but it's difficult in practice, uh, for sure, but it is our common goal and we, we will not change uh, this goal. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, so with, with your certificate, there are probably you need to check, but probably 13 countries where it should be recognized today. And the goal is to be recognized into the 28. Um, the other thing is that the, it's, a, it's a very technical uh, topic, but we need to be able to certify at low levels because there are some uh, free euros objects uh, we will never spend uh, um, a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of expertise to uh, to evaluate those objects. It's nonsense. So we need low level of evaluation. Uh, I consider that we need to develop also self self certification. Why should we not trust for those low level of evaluation the people who do the products themselves? Why not? And we have the all range of evaluation and at the other end we need to be able to certify at very high levels some products uh, that may have impact uh, on our security, national security. And well, this is maybe the only situation where uh, European recognition is not acceptable. And between those two extreme situations, we need to have a whole range of uh, solutions. Uh, for the lowest, we can be based on um, system based on compliance um, and uh, we just Im you can imagine schemes with a list of things that have been to check uh, and we check the box and at the end if you have enough boxes on the good side uh, you have the evaluation and above we need expertise that's our experience uh, we, we built our uh, certification schemes 25 years ago in both Germany and France and uh, we cannot imagine a system where it's possible to really trust at a high level a product or a service um, without um, having, without involving real experts, independent experts that are controlled by uh, uh, public administrations li like us. So this is a, the global idea. So we, we have seen the proposition of regulation uh, that has been published uh, yesterday. We consider that we still have to, to talk a bit uh, to be sure that it will be uh, efficient. It will cost the, the right amount of money, even if in some situation it costs money, clearly, uh, and takes time. And uh, the positive thing is that we have a common interest all together, the Commission, the Member States, uh, the industry, of course, the, the clients, to have uh, a good scheme able to, to deal with those products, those services, but also with very complex systems. You, you mentioned connected cars, for example, but there are many other examples where we need to be able to have an efficient certification scheme to deal with those new situations uh, that are going to be targeted, if, if it is not already the case, hmm. by many attackers in the future. Uh, your, your second point was... Uh, It is key to, de to develop this cooperation. Um, ju just because well, I see it in France at a national level, um, we, we have many common interests. Um, and I see no difficulty that cannot be erased between uh, public and private sector. Maybe it's just an opportunity to, to mention a, a key element. Uh, we are 500 in ANSI, you are 800, I think. So I will try to, to come back, but uh, <laughs> for the moment you, you win the race. Um, but we, we can have two or three more people. Uh, we will never be able to help everybody. We need a strong private sector in order also to do our jobs or part of our jobs. We need a strong pri private sector able to provide audits, for example, security audits, able to provide uh, detection of attacks. Uh, all the potential victims will not develop their own capacity to detect the attacks. It's a very complex thing. We need people 
to be involved into the, re the response, incident response. And so we have the ability to do it. We won't be able to do it in, for all the potential victims. That's clear. Uh, our first mission is to, is to deal with critical infrastructures. And in case of huge attack, we will focus on critical infrastructures. And we won't be able to help the others even if we would like to. So we need a strong private sector. And to do this, of course, we need a strong partnership between us. And maybe just an idea like this, uh, if we want to spend or to prepare some money to able to be spent in case of crisis, maybe the, a good idea would be to use this money not to pay for uh, the consequences, because we will never have enough money provided to do it. Uh, so the good idea maybe would be to use this money to pay for uh, those people from the private sector able to help the victims, either from their country or not, either from the public or the private sector. It's just an idea I, I share with you. All right. Arne, anything to add? <laughs> just, no, just very quickly. Number one is we, we are jointly working together on a kind of, let's say, uh, German-French labeling on, on the quick side, so that you have at least for these two countries, the beginning, and then probably can be a role model also for other countries. Number one, on the low-level side, public-private partnership. Just a short insight. In Germany, we are having the so-called Alliance for Cybersecurity with thousands of companies participating there. And there we are uh, exchanging information regarding who is attacked, how you, are re uh, uh, how you are reacting on it, what are the responses, uh, what are the best practices, and so on. And th this, I think, is the level how you are continuing it. And I think the core is, if we are speaking about public-private partnership, we don't have to discuss it always with the IT guys. We have to go to the bosses, to the executives, and they have to understand the overall issue. And I think none of the agencies globally, globally understands really what is going on in the details of IoT, on, I don't know, energy, on finance, and so on, because these are always very, very different kind of topics. And there, I think, we have to combine the different kind of knowledge we have so that we enhance together. Let's say really the, the level of information security. And I think there are also the private industry side, especially the information security companies like Symantec because they're sitting in the first row. <laughs> so we're getting also some information from it, of course. And this is very important to bring it all together. And I think this is one of the roles what the national cybersecurity agencies are having to orchestrate the different kind of information. All right. Well, with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.